I V M. So I remember going to almost somewhere around forty-five different villages across two months, where I used to, in the daytime, make the announcements, tell people about what is going to happen. In the evening, do these small shows. So some days I used to uh, show them regional Marathi films. Some days it used to be regional Gujarati films, depending on what village majority population was. Some days it was uh, dubbed Tamil films that we used to show across. Some days it was Hindi films that we used to show across. And every day we used to charge different tickets. Some days it used to be free. Some days the panchayat used to pay the entire money. Some days we used to show multiple ad. advertisements some day used to try playing the, the national anthem and see if people were even standing up for something like this so the, one of the biggest reveal for me was that most of the people in village don't know what a national anthem is so they were like this is just another video which is playing on screen why are we supposed to stand up hello and welcome to the filter coffee podcast The year was 2017 and I had heard a lot about this event called the India Film Project from many people I know. So I decided to travel to Bombay and check out what the buzz was all about and I was astounded. On stage you had some very interesting representations of cinema, television and streaming creators and interesting sessions. But the audience is what blew my mind. Thousands of young people between 17 and 25, most of them being a paid audience as this was a ticketed show. and one of the most engaged audience i've ever seen for a non sports non music event 5 years later i still remember being overwhelmed by that energy in the room that day i could sense that a very different creative movement is taking shape in this country the mind behind this event ritam batnagar is someone i had met only a year before that until date have been a huge fan of Ritham was barely 20 when he created IFP and today it is one of the biggest creator movements in the country one that has already gone beyond cinema to the creator economy and also technology I spoke to him about his extraordinary entrepreneurial journey that began in Ahmedabad when he was barely out of college and took on many different shapes I also spoke to him about his deep understanding of ticketed audience in India and his extraordinary knack for making life choices and sticking to them Stay with us. We'll be right back on the Filter Coffee podcast. Hello, hello, hello! It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On the Habit Coach, Doctor Vishaka tells Ashton how it's possible to reverse chronic disease with lifestyle changes. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam meets Sushil Agarwal. He's the founder and director at Ethica Insurance Broking. They talk about the importance of choosing the right health insurance policy. On Smarter with Sid, Siddhar talks about comfort zones and how they hinder our growth. On Ek Chuski Finance, Priyanka shares seven super hit tips to manage your finances. And on Hans Vani, here's the story Shahid. It explores whether the respect for a martyr can change based on his caste. We've got some exciting news for you. IVM Podcast has launched merchandise and our first line is out now. Head to the IVM Podcast website and click on the shop tab and check out the first collection of t-shirts. Do follow us on social media as well. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Apple, wherever you do that, that is really helpful for us. And do remember you can also check a lot of our shows out on YouTube. If you go to ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube, you get a list of all of our channels. We're also doing a small listener survey, so please do help us out with that. If you go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey, it'll help us understand a little bit more about our listeners. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance, Jupiter, a digital banking app, and Capgemini. Get the future you want. Thank you so much. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. Welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast, Ritam. How are you doing? Absolutely good. I think uh, recording on a weekend is a great idea because uh, I took yesterday's time to collect over so many things that I said, "Hey, I am going to speak about this. I am going to speak about that." So many things that I have like made a mental note of. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, because I think this conversation was going on since quite a few uh, yes. months now. Uh, so we are excited. I think I think I think for for many months I've I've been uh, telling you that we should we should do the episode. and i'm yes. glad it finally happened and thanks for you know taking time out on on a weekend where are you talking to us from so this is the ifp headquarters that we have made what headquarters i think we just have one single office right now but we have a entire team of 40 people sitting right now here in ahmedabad so just before the pandemic we 
decided to move the entire team to bombay we said hey we had small chunk of team in mumbai a small chunk of team in ahmedabad small chunk of team in bangalore and we said hey let's consolidate it, get all of them in bombay pandemic happened all of us went home and then we said hey the, the model the way we are going to work now is going to change drastically especially when you have almost 70% of your team which is gen z so a lot of people were like we don't mind changing a city as long as our lifestyle is going to be comfy so we had a space in ahmedabad which was owned by us so we just redecorated it did it into a proper office we said hey aa jao yahan pe and most people surprisingly agreed which is not something that i had thought about i that a you know, couple of people might choose remote working couple of people might come to ahmedabad again there is no liquor here so because there is no liquor people <laughs> typically have a lot of like that has become a pain point for us to do hiring now so every time we are going out looking for we fill the place where it gets stuck is not their role not the money is it gets stuck at the liquor part <laughs> right yeah yeah i know i mean I, i don't think we'll get to this part in the conversation <laughs> but uh, as you know I, i lead a team of uh, fairly young people as well and uh, maybe a few of them drink these days i've seen pictures of the office it's fabulous it's the same vibe that i see in the event which is ifp is a better part of your team from ahmedabad uh no in fact a lot of us from are from multiple states now in fact i think if you count out people who are from gujarat that would be just four people out of 40 Oh, wow. so 10% people but somehow we got registered because at the city i just love amdavad i've done my graduation here uh, so uh, i did spend and of course the first few years of ifp did happen in amdavad so i did spend a considerable time in the city and i realized that the kind of work life balance that i was always looking for is what the city offers it's not too fast and being an internet company that has never been a problem because most of our things anyways happen on internet so i don't think so location was ever right. a issue for us of course being in mumbai for a couple of years did give us an access to the larger creative community in india but then we thought hey now we have got that access i don't think so that we have we did a entire pros and cons of hey why should we be at amdavad and why should we be at mumbai and my team was more excited to move to this new place so yes excellent <laughs> right there there are a couple of points there about first few editions yap and why people would uh, would choose to go to amdavad to to stay there but we're getting ahead of the story i want to start right at the the beginning so but, with the uh, office uh, just letting uh, it at this entire office is designed by me so i did the entire interiors and everything because i thought wow. if it's an office it should reflect what i see the organization versus an interior designer looking at it so i just took up the project for the first time downloaded some softwares which are 3d rendering things you know interior designing things that you get free of cost just started putting up things and i had the measurements so i said hey this is the best way of how i can probably make this place look so that's what it is <laughs> which is a very interesting point because it's very quintessentially you right like i remember i think uh, four or five years back in the offices of unilever you and i had a long chat and even by then you know ifp right. was a big event and you always been a diy sort of an entrepreneur right like you'll yes. you'll, you'll go out there build it figure it out yeah, see yeah. how it goes change it around and all of that right it's a great place for us to start you know which is which is your younger years but before that i just wanted to tell you that uh, the what you said about amdavad the same way i feel about another city in gujarat which is barodara when i was working in a company called nielsen we had a lot of our back end operations oh, right. out of barodara and uh, i that city and that vibe is just something else this is one of my most favorite yes. cities to uh, to hang in india coming back tell us about your younger years where did you grow up what was the dream to tell us all about it so i'll draw a lot of parallel i i think couple of weeks back as listening to your uh, to your show with ajit andare and i was like hey would this looks like my childhood exactly of how it unfolded so i am a son to a scientist my father is an astrophysicist he was like when i was a kid he used to travel across the world on his research purposes built one of the largest telescopes in india so for oh, me wow. that used to be a cool thing like when most of my classmates had their parents who were largely doctors or businessmen i said hey my father is a scientist and he built a telescope and then my schoolmates my batchmates used to visit that telescope as a picnic like my school used to organize shows on a saturday evening to that place and uh, so i grew up pretty much into a household which had the first computer of our city and uh, it was so big thing that the this mayor is, this is in which part of the country this is amdavad amdavad yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, this is where uh, uh, the mayor and the municipal commissioner used to come across to see what does a personal computer look like. And this is 1988 I'm talking about. Wow. And we had the first color monitor, like a huge, if you remember the color monitors used to be like huge, you had to like, keep them three feet away from the wall so that they don't heat up as well. So I spent a lot of my childhood between science, making those smaller projects. I remember when I was nine year old, I coded my first program in Visual Basic. So my father gifted me a handbook of Visual Basic and nine years uh, old. I was nine year old. Basic. I just made a notepad. You could save a file and you could uh, retrieve a file. Basic stuff that I used to do across. And I called that company Rhythm Software. And then I learned uh, there used to be a program called Paint Shop Pro, which is much. Uh, earlier version of Photoshop. Yeah. So I used to go to Paint Shop Pro and design my own logos. Every software had a different logo. And uh, I learned video editing pretty much early. So though there was no computers, but my father got a digital camera, I think somewhere in 96, 97, very early digital cameras, which used to record on VGA. So I used to shoot stuff, random stuff like, you know, just park and the garden and the I used to shoot stuff, edit it across and uh, put it for uh, my own later memory kind of things. Again, uh, I think for me, largely it was this curious person who wanted to become a professor. So I had always seen my father being that person who used to teach. So I said, Hey, I want to become a professor. I, someday I want to go out and uh, teach people about physics. I want to become something in electronics. I want to be that person who is, who is uh, probably making the next big discovery in the world of science. So I think that is what largely my world used to be around. Uh, unless uh, or until I'll say uh, I hit my graduation. So I used to be a bad student, like 12th standard. I remember I just made it through my 12th standard by one extra grace mark. Like so maths <laughs> my passing percentage was 56. I scored 57. I was a horrible student throughout, but I used to be good at every other thing in my school. So of I used course. to be good at yeah. organizing quizzes. I used to be good at directing plays. I used to be good at putting up science fairs. I used to represent my school at every possible science fair that was happening around, you know, and when I was in 10th standard, I designed a, a Mars rover for NASA, which was an open competition for kids. And I stood second globally. So for me, wow. that was a big thing to have more than 1500 entries and then standing in the top three globally occur. And then one day the entire fairy tale broke even got into a graduation again. It was electronics, but not engineering, but a BSc into electronics. The dream is gone types. Absolutely. So suddenly <laughs> that comes into picture. Then you have uh, the university grades that you have to take care of. Surprisingly, I also moved across cities to make my graduation happen. And uh, one of the key things that I probably learned from the graduation is how to open up. Because I used to be this close child kid who used to be in his own uh, you know, small cocoon of things. I used to do things, but not without many friends. Like I tell this to a lot of my uh, friends these days is that a lot of people in my school who studied with me for good 14 years, I wouldn't have spoken to almost 70% of my batch. You know, imagine 70% people I never spoke in those 14 years. I used to be like, hey, my group of friends, my science things that I used to love, my same group with whom I used to direct plays, and that's where my entire world ended and all the technology and everything that my father used to keep giving me across. When I came into college, suddenly I realized that, hey, the world outside is very different. You know, this is not what I probably foresaw it at, uh, accordingly. You know, I was coming from a very, I don't even have a word for it. That opened up a lot of things. So the first thing I did was in the college, I realized I knew that I'm not a great person at study. So I joined every possible committee. I was a person who used to lead the student activity committee. I used to lead the sports committee. I used to uh, lead the astronomy committee and the cinema club and everything that I could get my hands into whatever time I had. And that gave me a lot of exposure about how and what more can be done. I think because I remember I watched the first film of my life, probably when I was in 11th standard in a theater. So Which one though was it? I think it was some Bollywood film, Ritika koi film to tha. I don't remember. Probably okay. koi mil gaya hoga us time. Because I did, went to Google and I was searching 2003 mein which film came out. So I think that was the first time I saw a film on a big screen. So for me, and not that we didn't have accessibility. I was hardly living 100 meters away from a multiplex. But uh, I never had that curiosity. So my father grew me into a person who would actually become a successor to his science experiments. You know, Someone who would eventually become very much like him. And I think that's what he also probably expected me to 
become until one day i think uh, in my second year of my bachelor's i saw this huge advertisement about mba and i called him up and i said i want to do mba and he's like you wanted to pursue msc and you wanted to do phd right he said yeah he said uh, he said ha kar lo mba if you want so the next day i go i enroll for a a uh, coaching class for the cat and i start preparing for the cat and for next one and a half years i am preparing for the cat and surprisingly i used to be a low scorer in my school right. i became a university medalist in my college and for the cat i was probably amongst the highest people in my own city so i scored some 99 percentile in my first attempt wow and that was the surprise for me because my internal story was that hey i am not good at many things in my life and suddenly for the first time that validation came from outside saying that hey you are much better than what you think uh, you could do across so i think that is what my largely childhood has been from there to couple of internships into media field then you know starting the entire ifp and then that journey has been a never ending one but i think my college played that very important role and i tell people whenever i am hiring i tell people saying that hey uh, even a lot of my cousins who come to me and ask me what college i should go across what course i should choose i tell them saying that hey always give your college the first priority see what college you are going to the college culture is going to play a bigger role into your you know shaping your career or shaping yeah. you as a person than what the course is going to be i don't think so i use any part of electronics in my life i hardly barely remember what i learned back then but what i took back is how probably those 3 years have changed me 180 degree like my mm. school mates would come to me probably during my college days and say that you are very very different than what we thought a person who used to hardly speak to five people in the entire batch is now giving across lectures is going speaking at multiple places so i think that development for me was the turning point from that cocoon to opening up to the world this is a fascinating story you know what i'm observing in this right is right from your science fair days to your committees to to multiple other things you always had that element of hey i'm going to lead something i'm going to organize something right like the yeah yeah, yeah. the the mindset in of, retrospect yeah yeah the mindset of organizing right is is yes. a huge and and not i mean 9 out of 10 people don't have that uh, that inclination to to begin with right which is right. i guess it's a sign of what you would do eventually uh, in life but did you do your mba eventually I did my MBA, but I didn't attend my classes at all. I was again organizing there, so I <laughs> I went to my MBA. I said, "Hey, what is something that I should be doing?" Is internships used to be very uncommon thing in two thousand six seven. Mm. You know, people internships used to be that compulsory part of course that you had to do for certain credits. So I uh, went across and I said, "My MBA classes used to get over by half a day." So I went to uh, local companies. I said, "Kahin pe to internship kar leta hu." There was this Micah guy who was uh, running, uh, who was planning to start a film club. so i said hey i'll become the number one person in your in your team because he was like solely trying to do it so he got a office space and he was saying hey let's do something into film space xyz so i joined him and uh, we started a film club together and uh, it was called sunset boulevard and sunset boulevard film club used to be showcasing world cinema in a pvr theater so what you used to do is every thursday evening we used to uh, bulk buy one screen with from pvr for say 100 rupees a seat and then we used to get uh, uh, world cinema films or regional cinema films which were usually not available on internet or not even on television so we used to play those films every thursday one new film that you get to see right so the first time we did it uh, we got somewhere around uh, out of 180 uh, auditorium we could fill in around 160 seats wow. and we used to sell it at a premium so uh, for example we used to buy it for 100 rupees and then we used to sell the ticket for 300 and i'm talking about 2000 9 8 specifically 2008 when 300 rupee ticket was a big deal yeah uh, and especially for a city like ahmedabad so uh, people were like uh, uh, you know for the first first time we did it we got 160 people second time we did it around 180 people and then the third screening that we did uh, the consecutive thursday was godfather and suddenly we sold three screens like three screens end to end now thursday is usually a dead day for any theater company for any exhibitor so it is very unusual to have like three screens completely sold out so what we did next thursday was show the second part of godfather and we could sell somewhere around all four and a half screens like we could and people were flying down from delhi and bombay because this was <laughs> for the first time that godfather was getting screened on a bigger on a movie theater so that is how we started across this entire 
पार्ट ऑफ लाइक यू सेड ऑर्गेनाइजिंग वाला पार्ट सो दैट इंटर्नशिप वेंट इन टू बिकमिंग अ फुल टाइम थिंग फॉर मी काइंड ऑफ इन स्टार्टअप एंड वन फाइन डे आई रिमेंबर पी वी आर में से बिकॉज दिस वॉज अ न्यू पी वी आर दैट हेड ओपन अप इन अहमदाबाद एंड आई वॉज स्टिल माई फर्स्ट ईयर ऑफ एम बी एस वी वुड हैव प्रोबली डन समवेर अराउंड ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फाइव शोज ऑफ फिल्म एंड आई थिंक पी वी आर में था अजय सर अजय बिजली वॉज इन अहमदाबाद टू सी हाउ दिस प्लेस लुक्स लाइक सो ही केम ऑन अ थर्स डे कंसिडरिंग दैट ही गेट मोर टाइम टू एक्सप्लोर इज प्रॉपर्टी एंड सडनली ऑल द सिक्स स्क्रीन फॉर कंप्लीटली फुल बिकॉज वी वर शोइंग अ फिल्म माजिद माजिद इज फिल्म कॉल टर्टल कैन फ्लाई सो टर्टल्स कैन फ्लाई हैड अ great crazy following and again we had people flying down from bangalore to see that film yeah. and uh, that, remember, that film is, even till date is not available in most online platforms it's not available right uh-huh. and i remember because my job was to go to the producers and get the rights for film screening right so, so, so you you, uh, you you screen what you, dvds or uh, digital uh we used to screen uh, using blu ray discs blu ray discs uh, for certain films which were not available where the producer would courier but we would never receive we would screen using a dvd i have also used a torrent to screen across because the producer told me saying that hey i have already couriered it we announced the tickets are sold and now we don't have a copy so i said i'll just download a torrent i'll put it across take wow. across so we've done uh, we used to spend tens of hours into that projector room figuring out how do we put our input into their projector because those projectors the fairly new projectors were very locked with the kind of key that you had to put right you had to insert that mm. key before the show could play so we found out hacks of doing that how to use their projector not to rent a new projector and all those things that we used to do so ajay vijli got fairly surprised he said hey i have never seen in my career so many people on a thursday so what is happening exactly because there is no big release right now and i remember this was somewhere around uh, fairly around march or april march it would have been so the cinema manager called up and said there are two young kids who are running some film club and earlier they used to sell individual tickets now they sell membership so he got so fascinated and i remember he called us meeting uh, for the meeting next day and he's like yeah this is something that i want to probably take to next level and that's how the entire director's cut at pvr germinated so wow. uh, to shila aditya with whom i started the entire uh, film club and uh, he was my first boss later on moved to pvr and then the entire pvr directors rare and directors cut of doing showcasing niche cinema across i think came from there so that used to be a film club that we started uh back then so for me my mba was actually that film club because i fairly spent most of my time out of my classes into running that place well i do i do hope you got a revenue share out of this director's cut thing <laughs> some decent pocket money <laughs> excellent okay we'll leave it at that <laughs> you know but but tell me it's fascinating that uh, you know you mentioned this story because i was just going to ask until you mentioned now that uh, you you know the, the first 15 minutes of our conversation you had not mentioned cinema and you you had mentioned your passion for organizing you know committees your your restlessness just doing the normal doing something bigger etc what does cinema mean to you the reason i'm asking you this is just like you know as i felt uh, about thursday afternoons i also never thought that events about cinema are going to be crowd pullers until i think i don't remember now very well 5 6 years back was my first uh, ifp and as i was sitting in that auditorium and uh, just you know looking at the vibe there these are like thousands of people who had paid this is paid entry they had come and they are enjoying and the you know the the energy in that room was the auditorium was was phenomenal right and yeah. i also felt the same way i did not think this could happen right so i will get to that question in just a bit but go back to what cinema means to you in your life because i i recently asked you is you know you mentioned that you saw only one film here and then childhood was also very much like that because you know my my parents had this rule that if a film i grew up in chennai so if the film was not made by maniratnam or balachandar or kamalasan then we don't see it in theater it it's just good enough for for vhs right tell me about what cinema means to you my definition of cinema before college and after college would be like completely different because when i was in my school larger part of my cinema was the video cassettes and the cds and dvds that my father used to get across from different countries so i was very much exposed to world cinema so the first time i saw 
film in a theater was for the first time i probably saw a hindi film across because again at my home we just had dd network my parents were very much against cable i still don't know why but now i understand i would have been a very bad child in studying so they didn't get a cable <laughs> connection across so my only window to probably watching films were those dvds that my father used to get across you know so he used to i remember he had a huge collection of richard attenborough so i used to watch those films he had a lot of older films eight and a half federico fellini's eight oh, and wow. a half you know uh, uh, he had metropolis so i had actually uh, seen a lot of those films as a kid and i always thought that this is the kind of film that everyone sees plus you know mere ghar mein there is not a lot of film film centric thing so there are hardly any discussions about uh, you know happening around it so most of my knowledge was limited to whatever i was seeing then and i always thought this is the kind of films that should be for example i remember bicycle thieves watching uh, you know watching bicycle thieves as a kid and that used to be a very eureka thing for me i was like hey i want to become a kid like this you know or watching citizen kane and you know i, I so those used to be 10 commandments i watched across multiple times so i had those kind of films suddenly when i saw the, uh, bollywood films for the first time and once i came into college every outing used to be a film outing you know we had nothing to do we were studying in ahmedabad you don't have liquor you don't have anything else to do so what do you do is you just go to so we used to go to watch films across and then every film for me used to be an eye opening thing so unlike a lot of people i met in film club who said hey i used to watch a lot of bollywood films or indian films and now i am watching world cinema for the first time and this is so interesting my life was exactly opposite my life was like hey i have watched so much of world cinema and now suddenly this is a new thing to me you know because uh, not that i was not aware about what's happening but i never took literal interest or a active interest into what's what's the indian cinema looking like plus i used to watch a lot of telefilms that dd used to telecast you know mitti ke rang and a lot of those hindi telefilms that they so for me i thought this is how most films are little like now i think post my college days i have seen a lot of 90s ka hindi cinema lot of regional films across and probably that is one of the reasons that uh, the first time i got acquainted to indian cinema i felt this is probably not the kind of films that we i was used to watching because suddenly quote unquote the kind of films that we make are intellectually probably not at par at what and probably i am talking about this this is again 2005 6 i am talking what were not at par at the kind of cinema or the films that i used to one of the things that i did was when i graduated out of my mba i met couple of people and still because i was in amza but i met a couple of people who were interested in probably redefining gujarati cinema we three guys who were all 21 22 year old came together and produced the film called kevirite jaish and kevirite jaish was the first urban looking gujarati film and uh, we were all 20 to 23 year old so we really didn't care if it worked or it didn't work but we had put good 18 months of efforts into making this film happen and that film went on houseful for 8 weeks straight and i was also distributing it because there was no distributor no distributor was ready to take up a film because typically gujarati films were made for a budget of 5 6 10 lakhs and they took up a government ka 15 lakh ka subsidy so they made money on the subsidy itself we made a film which was almost a crore and a half and wow. uh, uh, and that was a big bet to take at uh, that particular time and uh, the distributors suddenly refused and i remember we were just 15 20 days before the distribution before the release which we had already announced and we were completely hoping for a disaster because we knew that we won't be able to recover the kind of money because we kept on overspending to not compromise on the quality uh, but that is what i wanted to make because i think my entire thought of becoming a part of that project came because i said hey can i make a difference probably not to the hindi cinema setup but probably much closer to the home probably can the gujarati cinema setup change and can i be a part of it and i think that thought of the kind of films that i had seen earlier uh, visually the way they were the way people performed the pe- way they were written and my cultural shock that happened when i saw the earlier bollywood films i think that led to kevirte jaish being so fine tuned that i remember for the first 8 weeks there was Uh, i got a call from the mayor of uh, amdavad saying that hey i am looking for seats for eight people from my family and i couldn't arrange it for seven days because everything was full and that film went on to change the way people perceived gujarati cinema for for all together like that opened up and this is 2012 so uh, we are just going to celebrate the decade of that film next week but the things 
I think so. What I'm trying to largely tell you is that my perception of cinema, what I had versus what I built, also played a role in what I was going to probably do and contribute across, and probably also germinated the entire thought of creating IFP because I thought I was meeting a lot of people who were different, who wanted to tell different stories, who were wanting to be cut off from the mainstream, but they were struggling. And I, you know, IFP started as that place for those people to come together and collaborate and do something because they all wanted to break away from what was happening and they were not liking it. Right. Multiple thoughts from what you just said. Uh, one, of course, is uh, you mentioned uh, bicycle thieves, and uh, the only other person I know on whom it had a huge influence and which made him become a creator is a gentleman by the name uh, Shwetajit Ray. So it's a great, great. You're in great company there. But tell me, after a film like this, the Gujarati film you made, ideally, you and I'm assuming everybody around you would have thought that you would go into that route, make make more films. Right. You've tasted success, etc. Right? But but you ended up uh, doing something else. So probably now is a good time to talk about the birth of IFP. How did that happen? Hey. So, very small story around it is that before I was even working on this film, in fact, when I was working on the Gujarati film Kevri Tejish, it's the same time when IFP ka first edition happened, and it's also the same time that I came up with an idea, went to Mindshare with it. Mindshare said, "Hey, this looks very interesting. Do a pilot." And uh, I would have been again just out of my college. The the idea was called Touring Talkies. So my larger idea was saying that, "Hey, you chunk of Indians." are not watching the films the way we are watching on a large screen right so how do we probably create that experience for them how do we take cinema to villages so i just picked up a very old thought which was have a vehicle which moves to different villages and showcases uh, this so i went to mindshare team they were very excited they said hey first you do a pilot because you are a kid show us what does your pilot uh, give us across in terms of results play some of our brand advertisement see what is the kind of recall that comes out of it got a gentleman who just not even an angel investor he just gave me money and said hey go out get your vehicle get your stuff and start doing it if this works we'll talk about money so i remember going to almost somewhere around 45 different villages across two months where i used to in the daytime make the announcements tell people about what is going to happen in the evening do these small shows so some days i used to uh, show them regional marathi films some days it used to be regional gujarati films depending on what village majority population was some days it was uh, dubbed tamil films that we used to show across some days it was hindi films that we used to show across and every day we used to charge different tickets some day it used to be free some day the panchayat used to pay the entire money some day we used to show multiple advertisements some day we used to try playing the, the national anthem and see if people were even standing up for something like this so the, one of the biggest reveal for me was that most of the people in village don't know what a national anthem is so they were like this is just another video which is playing on screen why are we supposed to stand up right so i did that that project was happening in parallel Parallelly, I was also working on this film, and we were in the pre-production stage, trying to convince people why it's not just another wedding video or a local Gujarati film, but it's an urban thing. So we were wanting it to look and feel like a like the kind of film you would want in multiplex, and you would pay it hundred to fifty rupees for it to watch. And parallelly, I also saw that a lot of filmmakers around me. because i used to run a film club it gave me some smaller projects that i used to do so i used to curate a couple of film festivals and that is probably my earliest earnings that i could get out of so i saw a lot of filmmakers around me always coming to me and talking about our every discussion with a filmmaker used to end on the topic saying that i don't have anyone who can work with me or you know i have an idea but i don't have time to execute it or most of the people used to be hobby filmmakers so they used to work five days in some the manufacturing industry for two days they used to learn basic filmmaking on youtube and do this approach this is again 2011 i am talking about when being a filmmaker used to be more of a hobby rather than a profession so back in those days i was like juggling three hats continuously so i used to go to villages also work on pre production for my village and also was working on an idea which could later on probably become india film project so i think all those three things were happening simultaneously so i had one chance to take i said out of these three i can just do one thing now the good part with the touring talkies was that my pilot didn't give me the kind of numbers revenue wise to sustain and hence it automatically got deducted out of my list so i said hey this is not sustainable unless a bigger company like unilever comes and pitches in a product like wheel and does like a huge buyout but that would again be a completely revenue you know advertiser driven model it will never become self sustaining with on on its own tickets and this is pre ufo era so ufo had not kicked in so the only way you could show films was using dvd xyz right so then i had two options the film did very well 
सो वॉट आई डिड फॉर नेक्स्ट कपल ऑफ इयर्स वॉज आई केप ऑन डिस्ट्रीब्यूटिंग अलॉट ऑफ गुजराती फिल्म बिकॉज प्रोडक्शन में अलॉट ऑफ पीपल फ्रॉम बॉम्बे टर्न डाउन टू गुजरात दे वर लाइक हे वी आर फ्रॉम बॉम्बे वी नो हाउ टू मेक बेटर फिल्म एंड दे स्टार्टेड मेकिंग अलॉट ऑफ फिल्म लॉट ऑफ मनी स्टार्टेड पोरिंग इन बट देर वॉज नो वन वॉज हेल्पिंग दैम डिस्ट्रीब्यूट सो आई हेड दैट मोनोपोली फॉर गुड फोर इयर्स बिफोर आई स्टार्ट आई आई थॉट दिस इज नॉट द इंडस्ट्री आई वॉन्ट टू डू इट बिकॉज इट्स प्रॉब्लम नॉट मेकिंग द काइंड ऑफ इम्पैक्ट दैट आई वॉन्टेड टू मेक इन माई लाइफ एंड बाई दट टाइम आई एफ पी वॉज ग्रोइंग थोड़ा बहुत कर करके वी आर डूइंग एट ट्वेंटी थर्टी परसेंट ईयर सो फॉर द फर्स्ट ईयर वी डिड इट वी एड सिक्स हंड्रेड पीपल द सेकंड ईयर वी डिड इट वी हेड अराउंड ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड पीपल सो आई वॉज बेसिकली जगलिंग थ्री हेड्स यू नो आई वॉज डूइंग दिस टूरिंग टॉक इज इन विलेजेस विच वॉज कम्प्लीटली डिफरेंट ऑडियंसिस आई वॉज प्रोड्यूसिंग अ गुजराती फिल्म Uh, which was completely a different audience again a black hole that we were going into we didn't know if it's going to work or not work for us and simultaneously also a lot of filmmakers that i used to meet who had this constant problem uh, or a constant complaint saying that hey i don't uh, get a place to tell my stories i don't have time to shoot my films i don't have new people to collaborate to and that is where i think when all these thoughts were going on i had to pick up between them thankfully the touring talk is thing didn't work because the numbers didn't meet across you know the kind it was not revenue supportive a lot of advertiser support was needed and it was also a huge capex because we had to buy the vans and then buy the projector and all the systems so i just checked it out of my list so then there were two things that i used to do so i used to still uh, distribute a lot of gujarati films because uh, when the first film became a super hit a lot of talent and money started flowing back from mumbai and mumbai is fairly known because a lot of people in the film industry in mumbai are gujjus so they said hey i am going to back to amdavad i am going to make a gujarati film but there was no one who was distributing it so that was a sweet spot for me i said hey i am the distributor i am going to make margin on whatever you are going to do and for the next 4 years i think i was still till 25 15 i distributed somewhere around 7 or 8 films in gujarati but then came a point where i had to choose between doing films or running ifp because ifp had grown bigger you know from 600 people that we started in 2011 with a which, which was a fairly very small setup we had more than 10000 people who were participating now so it took a lot of more efforts so i had to then take a call and i think i remember that night where i had to consciously take a call saying that what am i going to do out of these two the films were good money because i knew that industry was going to grow big people are always going to watch films so the money part is never going to be a problem there the bigger question was is ifp going to ever become so sustaining that it can probably compensate for the revenue or something like this and i remember having that discussion on a bus stand with my wife and uh, two of my friends it was a two two and a half three hour long discussion went on till 2 am and then we decided saying that hey chalo let's not do the films anymore because uh, probably that is something that someone else can do but ifp is something that someone else might not be able to do if i would do it so i think that was the larger cause and i think that's how i kept on narrowing so from three things to two things two things to finally one thing and the moment i went full time into ifp is when then we started expanding also fairly so we moved the base from festival from ahmedabad to bombay so the first five years we used to do it in ahmedabad so we moved it from ahmedabad to bombay and when you came in 2017 or 2018 would have been our second year in bombay like i that. think so yeah 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 uh, firstly that's, that's very analytical thinking right to be able to bring it down to that one thing that you want to spend time in life most people would love that kind of a wisdom that you had but uh, you know if i may ask you know at this point when you were distributing gujarati films four years into ifp how, how old were you i was 25 back then so at 25 you were a leading distributor of gujarati films yeah. and also the entrepreneur who was in four years of an event like ifp that right. that is Uh, sensation <laughs> that's amazing now in retrospect it does feel but when i was 25 i was like i have so much to achieve there is so less time which which i have in my hand i think you know <laughs> and i used to also run a startup in i am ahmedabad so i was incubated there which used to be a tech startup and it was the first startup uh, it was a geo location algorithm that we were working on so i had pitched this idea to i am ahmedabad and uh, out of 1800 ideas that came in they had to select top 10 and uh, i didn't had our tech co-founder so they said uh, they called me and uh, there was two rounds of interviews and then two rounds of presentation so in my final presentation they tell me think that ritham we love your idea but you don't know how to code you don't have a tech co-founder you don't have a team how are you going to even run a company like this and right. uh, i said uh, see i have a four three year track record of running ifp and i didn't had any knowledge of how media industry works especially a new age media setup like this i figured it out my way and they got impressed they were like chalo this guy might be able to do something like this so they selected me as the 11th person in that entire thing and i was the 11th startup that got incubated in that entire batch with an idea but with no money of how to with no knowledge of how to be able to do that 
right and we were the first startup out of that oh. entire huge batch to raise venture fund like first company to raise funds to grow our team went on to become a team of more than 25 people and that was also happening simultaneously so you know that was in retrospect it was it was like hey what driver seat i am into am i trying to become a distributor am i trying to drive a tech company which is now successful but doesn't have any revenue am i trying to drive a, a young content company what am i trying to do so, it's like i said you know that wisdom is very rare you know in terms of understanding that you know in your 20s understanding that time is finite in itself right. is a wisdom right and you, you tend to believe that uh, you can do 15 different things and you can do it so well and you probably are already doing it right but to be able to say that this is not sustainable and i need to focus right. on on one thing is just phenomenal but when you started ifp right what did you want to create and uh, what according to you has ifp become today when i started ifp i always saw it as a one time thing that i wanted to do in my life i said hey people are facing a problem they don't find people to collaborate they have stories to tell which they don't find time to do it so probably if i do a 50 hr filmmaking challenge that would become one place for people to come together find new teammates make a film over a weekend go back to their professions so that's how so i think that was just plain idea with no function of probably doing it again so it was something that i wanted to do it once um i once got 600 people it was very overwhelming because i was again 21 and a half something and i saw 600 people come for me in an auditorium on my idea and uh, make almost 86 films over those 50 hours so for me that was and this is 2011 i am talking about when cameras were not a sufficient thing internet was slow dslrs were costly so people still coming down from different cities to be a part of it because Uh, there is no internet so we used to happen offline so if you have to make a film you have to travel down to ahmedabad make a film and then go back to your city and if 600 people are at least 400 people who were not from the city were participating i think that was a good validation but i never saw it as a thing that i wanted to do again i had a very small office and one intern and one landline phone back then which was our official number and how ifp started is also funny story because i had this idea going on for a very long time something i did was i knew basic html coding so i coded a web bought a domain coded a small one page websites announced a 50 hr filmmaking challenge put a registration link and said hey if you want to register come to our office with a check or a demand draft pay 1000 rupees and register for yourself made a small facebook group added a lot of people this is not paid this is facebook group that used to be there you could add n number of people in a group so i just added n number of people into it as many people i knew announced it opened my applications clueless if it's going to happen not going to happen if people are going to come not going to come and the next day i come to my office there is one guy who is standing out with an application form ka print out and with the check is like i want to register and from there to the second year i remember the first time we did it like i told we didn't want to ever continue it it just happened as a one time activity the second year uh, we were and uh, largely my work was still you know moving between films and distribution so i had this one intern who gets a call and uh, on the call the person on the other side is asking thing that hey uh, when is the uh, ifp happening this time because i have to book my tickets to ahmedabad and we were like is someone even expecting it to happen second time and we were clueless so we got two calls over a uh, over a period of 10 days and that's when we said are chalo if people are expecting let's do it for the second time and i wrote a very informal mail to shujit sarkar saying that we are doing something like this it's a small activity based out of ahmedabad would you want to come and uh, he was he replied within 2 hours he's like in in positive he said yes if you can take care of my travel and stay i'll be happy to come and be a part of this activity and we were like shujit sarkar has said yes i don't know how this is going to work out i don't know if it, this is even something i would want to do for a longer time because it was just a second year let's do it now the thing with such stuff is if you do it once people forget it but if you do it twice then you have to do it continuously okay one is a solo thing if you do it twice then you are in this loop of doing it multiple times so i think i went into that loop of now second kalya let's do third third kalya let's do fourth and i think that's how it kept on moving across so that has been i don't know why i don't very clearly remember those earlier days of what was the thought why i kept it doing for the first 5 years when we were not even doing great money out of it so because we used to do ifp as a completely not for profit activity for the first 4 years because whatever expenses we used to get it for the serious? ticketing yeah yeah for the first because it never came out as a business to us for the first 4 years i thought this was my way of keeping my distribution wala 
part separate and that was paying my bills but this was my way of probably connecting with a lot of filmmakers when i decided that i now want to do full time ifp and i have enough bandwidth and resources and i think this can go big become big is for the first time i thought of it as a business i went across made a small sheet said hey these are my revenues these are my I still have that sheet across with me and i was just pondering it over last week i was taking some backup from my hard disk i just opened that folder up it had very basic heads it said okay ticket sales this much probably if we get a sponsor this much and you know uh, our expenses hall booking expense this much marketing expense this much it used to be just fairly and simple excel sheet that i used to run across uh, when we made it a business then that is where a lot of thinking went into place for the first time like thinking about hey now what do i do for the next 3 years how do i scale it up for the next 5 years because tab tak i was because i was on to multiple driver seats every business for me was like whatever pays let's do it whatever interests me let's do it i was 24 year old this hardly any expense i can call up my dad get the money whenever i need across so i used to be back then and the good part is the moment i started thinking about ifp as a business a lot of things changed because i said this can't remain the way it is for another couple of years i'll have to think of making money for me to survive i got married i had to take care of my expenses across so i think that is an end. and when the expenses started mounting i started putting more efforts into it and eventually i think uh, it was a good decision to continue with this one and probably not go with the other options that i had back then it's astonishing because uh, i've spoken to a lot of people in the industry right some of the biggest they directors and actors who are part of IFP and and when i ask them you know why do you guys go there like why do you spend time in that event what about that event interest so they always say that that is a raw energy of film appreciation and the passion for cinema etc reminds you a lot of why you started doing this in the first place right, right. and uh, they all say that, that that's the reason you know why we spend time there right and you know as you were talking about it i was reminded of it i i used to be a, a, an independent filmmaker in the in the previous decade and Wow! Uh, in 2000, I don't remember if it was 2003 or 2004 when Ifi was started in Goa for the first time. Yeah, uh, yeah, 2004. 2004. Uh, so Dave yeah. Benegal started this 24/7 film challenge. Right, right, right. And uh, that is the first time I even heard of something like that. Right. So you basically all of uh, us had to form a team of three, and we had to go to Goa. Wow. And uh, they would give us a theme huh. the night before the event opened. Huh. and uh, we had 24 hours to i mean of course there was a metaphor of 24 frames and all of that in 24 hours we have to write uh, shoot post produce and all of that and then you know, eventually they were like a team of jury will will, will decide right so oh. i i remember going to that event with uh, two people i had not met before and we had the most wonderful time right, right. even till this day we speak about it we, we became friends yeah. because we we went and made the right. film together right. right exactly that's the same crux that i was trying to chase for the first four years come here meet new people create a great memory and go back it's not about the film that you're creating i don't even know if you created the best film there at efi probably but that memory is always going to be with you exactly yeah in a way i think i think that is the the purest form of like i said you know film appreciation and and passion you know for for this world but um, you know now that you've come this far you know tell us about how ifp grew to what it is today and what are some of the interesting anecdotes you know that that you remember from this journey so uh, till, till 2015 na uh, we used to be in a very softy comfort zone because it was happening in ahmedabad we hardly spent money on marketing most of the people used to come across and we were growing like how like from 600 people in 2011 we had reached almost 18 19000 people participating in the filmmaking challenge in 2015 and that's not a small feat especially when you are not investing anything in in marketing i think that is when subconsciously without knowing the word community i started realizing the power of what communities can do what people having the same kind of passion coming together can do so i think 2015 i for the first time i hired a team like hired more than two people in a team and we were like four people four five interns now and 2016 we were again going to do the same amdavat thing until one of my team members comes to me and said hey if you want to grow this big you have to be in bombay that is where all the in film industry and you are called india film project for a reason bomb amdavad no one is going to travel down because uh, i remember we were just one one month and some 6 5 6 days away from the festival and uh, overnight i just thought about it next day morning i take up the early morning uh, flight to bombay i reach down i search couple of venue uh, i stay there for two days book one of the venue come back and tell my team saying guys we are moving to bombay and they are like hey 
not this year it is not possible because just a month away how are we going to even pull the logistics we don't know how bombay looks across and this is when most of my team used to be for people from ahmedabad so i said abhi ho gaya decide i have paid the amount we have to go there we have to just put the first show there okay then the first time we did i have been mumbai again no marketing budgets basic some sponsors were taking care of our cost uh, and thankfully i remember uh, access bank being one of the brands which helped me crazily like i remember sagnik kosh used to be the marketing vp marketing for them and and i went to him in 2015 and i said ki you know this is when we were still in amda but 2014 and i told them saying that uh, we are doing a festival like this and uh, access bank ke sath we could do something because these are young people xyz and i thought he might come back to me and say kitne log account khulwayenge but sakning ghosh was like a different man so he tells me he says ritam i just love the concept i love what energy you are bringing and i love that you are trying to do something different for next 3 years we are going to become title sponsor so in a way we knew that hey the wow. money was flowing in let's just do it in bombay so i called them up i said we are doing it in bombay but our expenses are going up multifolds but we are also expecting more people to come and also the film making challenge will grow more people will participate he said yeah yeah whatever it takes just let's do it across there and for the first time i say i realized ki abhi festival ko kuch 20 days baki hai i still am short of funds because uh, bombay is far more costly in organizing anything than amdavad it's not like 1.2 times it's like 3.5 times costlier probably so i wrote to a couple of random friends from my college days one of them was working with nestle he said hey we are coming up with a new maggi product if you could integrate it i said love love whatever integration works i'll just do it but uh, let me do put this festival together and the first day we opened it up at bombay we also introduced a festival so we said not just filmmaking challenge but uh, we'll have a day long festival there would be couple of conversations you'll have all the tvfs and aibs and y films coming under a single arena and towards the evening we'll have the awards for the filmmaking challenge we thought we had a capacity for around 4000 people because amdavad mein when we used to see we used to see somewhere around 3000 4000 odd people coming in so it's a 4000 ka capacity of 5 6000 people in the flowing crowd can come in we had 11000 people coming in that day wow you know, we never this, this thought i never this is paid this audience is paid. this is paid audience so it was like it, it was crazily subsidized because the ticket used to be 400 rupees but even getting 11000 people for 400 rupees we had never seen that i had never 400 seen 400 rupees is, is more than what you will pay in a in a cricket ground right it's in uh, a cricket ground right yeah, yeah. and yeah. we had a capacity we, so you you used to do it at the nesco and nesco maybe took up two huge halls so we had a capacity which is somewhere around 5 6000 people that we could hold at maximum even if people were standing there was no space you know our production got damaged there was hardly there, there were long queues outside and uh, i was like why didn't i do this before why didn't i bring it to bombay way before because this is what people were looking for eventually and that was the first time that we introduced conversations on stage before that there was no conversation there was just the 50 hour film making challenge there was the award ceremony 3 hour ceremony and people used to come there see who wins what film gets win, gets the trophy etc so for the first time that was happening and i said if 11000 people are paying and coming inside a venue to just witness eight or 10 conversations imagine what will happen if we grow this into a place where you are going to have a lot of creative discourse right so of course there are a lot of limitations so then we moved to nehru center again uh, you know i don't come from a business family no one in my family has ever done business across so i'm uh, typically not the person who can like pull in money to scale things across neither ticketing or sponsorship is never a big thing like you come from the industry so you know that we are hardly working on 10 12 15% out kind of margin so we couldn't grow or scale it very fast so i said i have two options either i get funded get some uh, and this is the time when viacom had given us an offer for funding uh, when they saw the first edition happening so i said either we take some money make it bigger very fast or the second route is learn how to do it better and then keep on growing on a year on year basis so 2017 2018 we just kept on doing what we were good at we said okay chalo we are talking about films let's talk about digital let's talk about literature let's talk about music so we kept on adding multiple things year on year so then we kept on adding more dimensions to it so 2019 we put across the largest of show that we could put we took up entire mehboob studio got some of the biggest brands uh, on board as sponsors got one of the best lineups that we had across you know yeah. every possible youtube person every possible instagram person every possible film person director actors writers authors people from literature from writing from screen writing from poems so 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 many from news journalism domain and we realized that every time we were adding something new it was doing two things it was expanding the creator universe to a bigger domain so a lot of creators said hey i am a filmmaker 
but i heard something about music at ifp and i think this was very cool i never thought about it you know i want to become probably a musician now i would want to collaborate with a musician and this is the place i'll find right kind of musicians so we were expanding that and second we were also pushing the boundaries of how much big we could get into so we eventually wanted to move out from films so we introduced new challenges we introduced a 50 hour music challenge you have to create a original music track in 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 a duration of 50 hours introduced a design challenge a writing challenge a storytelling spoken word challenge across this year we are introducing a photography challenge stand up challenge and the thing is just across these challenges last year we saw 65000 people participate now just imagine 65000 people coming together creating so much of branded content and more than that these people going out collaborating for the first time and finding new people who are like minded like them you know so that is the larger ripple effect that it started creating a lot of people and i think that is what has kept us going is a lot of people came to us and said i found my director at ifp i found my writer at ifp or i found the musician for my next short film at ifp or i found my playback singer at ifp and this started happening so eventually the earlier purpose that we started from 2011 of getting people to collaborate started taking place more and more as we kept on growing you know so uh, this year we went through this entire rebranding from india film project to be now called ifp standalone because we realized that the film world for us is not something that justifies us anymore we have become or come at the core of uh, being this place that is very creator centric we want to speak to every kind of creator we want to become a community of people who uh, who or we want to reach out to every that person who thinks that creating can probably change their life you know uh, now they might pick up a pen to create they might pick up a camera to create they might pick up a mic to create whatever they are creating across because at the end that's one super power that humans have over other species is that we can create you know we can we created our homes we created uh, wall paintings we created wheel we created art we created plays and books and films so we can create right and right now the entire agenda is to make sure that we are empowering creators from any creative and technology field in whatever way we can so the entire idea of what now ifp stands is hey let's not just push people who are doing art or are subject into the creative art field probably let's also push a person to create who is a great coder you know because these days creating is not only about creating a movie or a song or a spoken word it's also about or how do i put it the creator also exists inside the engineer who is coding the next step that is going to change the culture right so we don't yeah. look at it from yeah. that point of view so this year we are expanding our domain and also opening ifp for for technologists for people who are coding people who are creating solutions that are probably tech enabled but they are also a work of genius they've put in a lot of planning and efforts and like it, like art creation it's also very free flowing you know uh, you can plan yeah. everything but you never have a control over the outcome so that's what ifp has become we have become like one place for creators and across this journey a lot of things that i think smaller decisions that kept on uh, kept on uh, uh, pushing us across were uh, we thought let's keep moving without always thinking about the outcome you know let's not think so for example 2017 18 we were doing a very slow growth across pandemic hit in especially 2019 for us was a bonus year because we sold probably highest number of tickets for any festival which sold around uh, 19000 tickets for the festival in mahbub studio another 60 uh, sorry 53000 people who participated in challenges we were like reaching out to 70000 creators from more than 40 countries across challenges and festivals so he said hey this is huge suddenly the pandemic comes in most of the festivals were getting cancelled you know and we said what how do we sustain a team of 30 people now because you have to pay the salaries you can't go across you can't even cancel things you can't even do a festival right now so we quickly developed a secondary model we we changed ourselves from a festival company to an ips company we said hey we'll work more closely with brands in creating ips like ifp for them so it could be a content ip it could be a digital ip it could be an on ground ip but uh, technically because we made our own ip bottom up we know every kind of possible challenge that can come up in growing an ip so we started going to brands and uh, and within it's almost two years that we started pivoting that and currently i think almost 80% of our revenue comes from Uh, the ips that we create for brands so the festival itself though festival is paying and it's high paying thing for us it still only gets us 20% now because the overall chunk has changed completely for us so 
I think keeping going is something that I've like learned for last five years. We just, I just told them, let's do something. Let's not stop. Let's not put a comma even. Let's just like write, even if you're writing it slowly. Right. It's fascinating. So when you say IPs, you mean like event IPs, like, uh, like IFP? Not event IPs. Largely, we want to be in the content and digital and UGC right. domain. Whatever right. IPs that we create where our, our community of IFP, which is now around eight and a half like people is central to it. So that's the idea. How do we utilize these eight and a half like people who have joined us in this movement? How do we probably give them branded opportunities? How do we create uh, interesting opportunities to level them up? That's what we have been doing. For example, something that we did very recently uh, is called a Spotify Podcast Lab. So it's a brilliant example of an IP that, uh, and now it's also going global. It's because uh, Spotify came to us with a very simple problem. They said, people are listening to podcasts, but people are not creating podcasts, right? How do we get people to create podcasts, especially people of variety? And we devised a small plan, which was, called a podcast workshop. Later on, we said, why do it once when we can do it annually every time? So we started this thing called Spotify Podcast Lab, which has become an annual thing. So it's like how, say, Coke has Coke Studio. That's the idea of creating those kind of IPs, which are content-centric, also have a huge digital leg, also have a user-generated content leg, also have an influencer leg to it, have a media and an on-ground leg to it. So there is a mix of everything. So Podcast Lab, we just completed our first season, got 200 people to produce more than 2,000 episodes of podcast within a period of four months. So we're now creating those kind of uh, solutions for brands. And how they are helping us is they're helping us take these solutions global. So for example, with Podcast Lab, the idea is now to take it to different countries wherever Spotify faces the problem of getting more uh, people into this domain, into podcasting. So in a way, we created something like this with Vivo, with OnePlus, with a lot of, with Fujifilm, with close to 14, 15 brands in the last two years. So that, and that comes completely from our own strength because we have a community. We built an IP of our own. So we know both parts. We have resources, we have knowledge of it, and hence it doesn't look like a force fit. Neither it is a force fit. It's a very natural extension to what we were doing. So the idea is now, how do we create many more IFPs for different brands? Of course, some might be in gaming domain, some might be in fashion domain, some might be in probably metaverse domain. But the idea is to create multiple such IPs now. Fascinating. You know, uh, uh, you you make a story of scaling sound so simple. You know, people write books on it, like PhD papers on on the on the kind of stuff you're talking about. And you mentioned sixty five thousand people right um, in 2019 and and i'm just thinking that's not far away from the number of people who will turn up to watch you know the indian cricket team or mumbai indians in one absolutely and, and these people yeah. are spread across the world yeah. so one thing that is happening is the kind of stories that we are getting for example at ifpr short film library right now is around fourteen thousand films out of which almost 70 percent of our library is regional because we get, you'll see a story of a person coming from Myanmar, you'll see a story of a person from Singapore and NRI living in Germany, you'll see a story of a person from Odisha, from uh, Chennai, you'll just see multiple stories with multiple facets. The same happens with whatever challenge that we, so the kind of output that we keep on seeing, every time it's like, hey, we never expected this to happen. For example, this year for the first time in 2021, we got a Russian film. Uh, at IFP. So the film which was made in 50 hours uh, and made in Russian language by a team which was natively Russian wow. completely. So not a single Indian related to them. And we were like, wow, we never thought in 2011 that we would probably have completely native right. language films coming in. <laughs> the more you talk about, uh, you know, IFP and the evolution, you know, beyond cinema, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, an event that used to happen in, uh, in Austin, which is uh, called South by Southwest. And uh, I got you know, introduced to that back in 2006. Uh, and the only reason I got introduced to that in 2006, South by Southwest was a very small music and, uh, you know, short film sort of an short event. Film and right. my film had gotten uh, shortlisted to be screened there. So I had gone wow. to Austin and uh, and I saw the vibe of the city. And, uh, you know, it was very different. You know, when, when this happens for the week, it was very different. But now when I see the evolution of South by Southwest, it is also very similar in trajectory to, to what you're doing, right? There is a technology angle to it. There is a creator angle to it. I think this is a model that has been waiting to happen uh, in India. So, uh, in yeah. fact, uh, for me, if you ask us, what do we want to become? What Where do we want to take IFP festival across? That would be probably somewhere very close to what South, South by Southwest does. It, it is happening very far away from the cultural center of US. It happens way in Austin. You know, it's, yeah. it's not yeah. happening in LA. 
yet it shapes culture for people across the world in multiple ways like i think that's the power of creating something like this so probably we are just creating mini south by southwest here <laughs> Yeah, it also also goes with uh, you know Austin's byline, which is uh, keep keep Austin weird. Is this the tagline of the city, right? <laughs> In twenty twenty two, what can people expect from from IFP? How are you envisioning this year's event? So one insight that has come from uh, my team is that this year people are waiting crazily to go on ground. Like you know, so we were we were exploring a hybrid festival because thankfully for us, virtual was very different than what many people experienced. because we we were very content focused we said let's deliver value let's not look at the kind of experience building that a lot of other festivals were looking at uh, which had went with issues and visual issues we just created our own platform did a virtual festival uh, last year probably we sold more tickets than we can ever sell for the festival any we, we had 32000 people who attended the festival last year the ticket price was wow. fairly low but people coming and paying for it is a validation you know so this year we were very really excited to do a virtual festival because my team was like why should we do even an on ground if virtual may we can pull up people coming from different countries which otherwise doesn't happen like you flew all the way to texas to attend south by southwest <laughs> that's not the no case. i was like, i was I'm, living in san antonio at the point it was a oh, one hour okay, okay. yeah yeah, yeah. A, okay but that's typically in india that's the same thing you know you can you get people from bangalore or bombay or pune who come to ifp but you don't yes. get people from chandigarh or lucknow to come to ifp so exactly. virtual yeah. for us solved that problem big way because 75% of our audience was non metro audience which for the first time saw what a festival looked like for the first time our chat boxes had more than 4000 5000 comments coming in for both the virtual editions that we did so my team was like let's do virtual i think virtual has a bigger it kills on the experience but it has a great way of reaching out to people whom we can't ever reach out doing an on ground then we moved from there and said chalo let's do an hybrid and the latest insight that my team came up to me and said was a hey, chuck hybrid no virtual let's just do the on ground festival people are dying to be at back at the on ground festival so we move we have like completely changed uh, what we did in 2019 at ifp this time we flick like, completely changed there are no panel discussions there are no conversations that we are going to do this time everything is going to feel like a game show so we have like gamified entire thing for example the first thing that we did uh, with thought was that panel discussions are boring conversations are done to death people come talk about the same thing a lot of things that you can now read on medium are things that people of course there are anecdotes to it but now people have like gone done with two people talking and hearing in a real room setup right so how do we overcome that so we devised a format like uh, for example one of the formats that we are doing this year it's, it's called 25 questions which means if it has say kartik nagrajan on stage and uh, imtiaz ali on stage and both of them have to ask each other 25 questions now they have to do their research come prepared and each of them gets one minute to answer ask the question and answer for example so fantastic so for example we have come up with more than 20 such formats like this and uh, we opened ourselves to a lot of new universes so for example we used to talk a lot about films and digital and literature and writing this year we are talking about audio and podcasting for the first time we are talking about gaming uh, for the first time we are talking about technology about photography about uh, visual art and street art for the first time so we have uh, picked up couple of spaces which we thought no one else was talking about in india or they were probably not talking in an influential way so we identified for example the performing arts is a big deal for a lot of people you know performing like i used to do a lot of plays in my school and college across i never made it or i never thought of it as a professional space because no one was talking about it you know i couldn't hear people i looked up to talk and tell me saying that hey this is a great space still you should still explore it professionally so we included performing arts so what we are now trying to essentially become is one place where you get to hear about everything that has to do with content but not just across visual and audio medium but also across technology also across gaming everything that impacts culture so from a film project we have become more of a culture festival now so it's one place where we are going to talk about things that are going to probably shape culture or are already shaping culture so that's how we have redefined the entire festival now fascinating and, and when can uh, when is it going on ground this year this time it's happening on 8th and 9th october excellent we are yet to close with the venue but again it's mumbai yes Yes, yeah, I'm sure everyone listening to this will, will will be on the lookout for it. Fantastic, and and I I don't know where time flew. Same, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a fascinating, fascinating journey. But we usually you know end the episode by by asking our guest uh, what he or she is uh, reading or watching or or listening to 
and what what your recommendations are to our audience anything interesting that you've read or listened to or watched that you want to recommend in your case i'm assuming there'll be millions so uh, currently i'm reading a book called open by andrea gassi uh, the greatest fantastic. sports book ever written yes the greatest sports book i just i think today would be my last two chapters that are pending because but i'm like already in the off the book akas uh, that's what i've been reading i am pretty late at reading a book which i think most of people would have read already is called sapiens i am sure it's like way done to death kind of a thing but from sapiens i started going more into this entire field of understanding how content overload is now affecting us and uh, i read a book called digital minimalism which is by uh, rodrick cafe which is uh, about how he did multiple researches on how too much of content and information is now hampering human brain in making decisions and how probably it's going to be a very anti evolution thing for us if we don't control the kind of content that's flowing in our brains now we are going to become less productive we are going to probably lose all the instincts that helped us grow or evolve as humans okay so digital minimalism is one book that i would probably recommend people because for me it has been an eye opener for last uh, month that i read it across okay, so it's like and it was a by product of sapiens because sapiens when they were talking about the human brain evolution yeah. so i wanted yeah. to understand how does human brain evolution happen in in the digital times because no one is talking about it right now in the present context what has happened and thankfully digital minimalism is one book across watching uh, i am that person who hardly watches films or shows you won't find me ironically I, I, yeah. ironically <laughs> yes i it is very difficult for me to have patience to watch something for more than 15 minutes but uh, i binge watch things that are that i love across for example i can i'm watch currently watching big bang theory for i think fifth time i can start <laughs> from any episode just watch it across i am and again the same goes with listening not a great listener but uh, of late i have got addicted to uh, listening a lot of retro hindi songs from 50s so geeta bali is something which has been on my playlist i just made a geeta bali playlist i was sending it to all my family groups i was saying like dekho mera playlist hai spotify you can go listen to it across and uh, the only people, person who got uh, happy was my nani she was right. like oh mere zamane ka <laughs> singer everyone else is like what is this so i think that's yeah. largely what i've been reading that's awesome in fact uh, i tell anyone who cares to listen that the 50s was across the world the greatest the time, time to time. be watching or listening to listening. Uh, anything around to. cinema right on, on one end yes. uh, orson welles is making citizen kane citizen kane yes and uh, felini is making his thing satyajit ray is starting out gurudat some of his best yes. work is in the 50s 50s in i don't know if you remember but in in, in tamil you know uh, one of the most popular films in the 50s without any song is a film called andanar where the protagonist oh. gets shot in okay. the first scene of the film Wow! So so many experiments used to happen in the fifties, uh, music wise and uh, cinema wise. That I think from then on everything has only gone downhill. <laughs> I have had a large number of debates around with people about how this entire you know we started creating. I think nineties, early nineties is when humans started creating in a mass production way. Like they started doing multiple mm, yeah. films, writing a lot of books. Before that, it used to be a very curated era. So the moment we entered from curated to mass era, we produced some of the best works. And ever since then, the number of works that come out in a decade, which are good, that number has been growing down drastically. Like, for example, yeah. you ask me one great English or a Hindi film from last one decade, I might be able to just count one or two. But the yeah. way you said, you know, eight and a half or Metropolis or Citizen Kane, yeah. all of them are from a single decade. Yeah. And this yeah. is probably we are just talking about English. There's so much. Uh, which happened across in world cinema during that decade, and like you said, every country probably put across their best work in in fifties. The fifties, yes, yes. yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, Ritham, uh, you, you're you're a huge inspiration. Uh, I I knew you know many parts of the story well, but uh, in spite of that, it was it was wonderfully inspiring listening to you. Good luck with everything you're you're trying to achieve. Thank you so much, Karthik, and I hope uh, this conversation was exactly what. or probably near to what you expected out of it but uh, great having a conversation with you i think it just took me into a huge nostalgia <laughs> tunnel right now so many things that opened up now i'm going to again open my touring talkies files and go through my videos and pictures today yes uh, and, and start writing that book <laughs> yes that, that memoir yeah <laughs> memoir great always inspiring thank you so much rita thank Bye. you yeah. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. 
you can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com you can also follow us on our social media we are at ivm podcasts on twitter and instagram and if you want to reach out to me i am the underscore karthik that's karthik with an h on twitter and filter underscore coffee that's coffee with a k on instagram There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh and I'm back with season 2 of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10 minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid.